in Ohio country today. In Ohio Country Today, brought to you in part by the following. Koenig Equipment, Allen Davis Insurance Agency, True Point Cooperative, Brumbaugh Law, the Ohio Soybean Council, the Ohio Corn Growers, and Rural Community Insurance Services. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of In Ohio Country Today. Big Dan Wilson alongside of him. My friend, your friend, our friend, Gary Jackson. Hi, friends. <laughs> Gary, when was the last time you saw a tractor in downtown Columbus? Uh, well, for me, Dan, it was about, about a year ago, but this is a special uh, event. The Franklin County Farm Bureau having a, a, a special farm days at COSI, and uh, this is something that goes on every year, draws folks, non-farm folks, in addition to some uh, rural families as well, out to find out about what agriculture is all about. You know, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, the, uh, the Farm Bureau and, of course, uh, our friends at the Ohio Soybean Council uh, would get together and bring uh, these dialogues to the uh, center of uh, science and innovation. You know, it's uh, interesting how technology and uh, farming has changed throughout the years. And even more so, we need to improve our dialogue between the farmer and the general public. Uh, very much so, Dan, and of course uh, a couple of panels are going to be uh, uh, discussed. We're going to have some of those panel members uh, later today, and, and folks can find out about uh, genetically modified organisms, what are GMOs, and also sustainability. What is that? Might be a little different than what our viewers think it is. Yeah, we might even take a little time to dispel some myths when it comes to GMOs and some other topics along the way. We're very proud to be a part of uh, today's dialogues and if you want more information you can check us out on the web at inohiocountry.com that's inohiocountry.com we'll be back with today's episode right after this most of us struggle with protecting the nest egg we've built and when you're suddenly faced with providing long-term care for you or a loved one you need someone now who you can trust to help you keep control of your home your farm and your assets protecting that nest egg is what we do best we're brumball law firm Call us today to schedule a free consultation anywhere, anytime. We'll come to your home, farm, or business to see if we can help. Brumball Law Firm, using Ohio law to protect your assets. Hello once again, everyone. We're visiting today with Dr. Ruth McDonald of Iowa State University. When we talk about nutrition, and you're a, a dietitian, and as we talk about various nutrition, what is the impact when we discuss uh, genetically modified organisms or GMOs as they're more commonly known? What kind of impact does that have on what we eat every single day? There's never been any evidence that genetically modified organisms change the nutritional value or the safety of the food supply. So there's really a negative or a null impact, just no impact at all of genetically modified organisms on the safety or the quality of the food supply. Do you think it's uh, the fear of the unknown? We as uh, consumers hear GMOs and maybe not know exactly what it's all about? Yeah, I think that the, the wording is very poor, the selection of genetically modified organisms. It's scientifically correct, but it sounds scary. And it also is something that most consumers don't understand fully. They don't understand the technology. They un don't understand how that gets in the food supply and then what happens to that after they eat it. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding about, you know, do I, does a DNA get into me? Does that you know, whatever that's in that product somehow change my body. And that doesn't happen. It's just, you know, basic understanding of digestion and absorption of nutrients. You don't incorporate those things into your body. Now, is it something that the uh, bottom line is everybody just wants to have safe food to eat? 
Yeah, absolutely. People are concerned about their food supply. That's a great thing. I think people should know about their food and where it comes from and how we produce it. Um, but to be afraid of something that you don't understand or to um, maybe buy into some of the misinformation that's being spread around pretty widely on the Internet uh, without really understanding, understanding the science and the real, you know, the risk of the benefits and the actual controversy around it is, is unfortunate that we have, you know, people that don't understand it to the point where they just don't want to have anything to do with it and they want it out of the food supply. You know, I think the, the family has, uh, or the fam family model has changed over the years, uh, where at one time, uh, maybe the, the young girl who is growing up knows how to prepare the food just like her mother always did, and then uh, as we go along, maybe not quite as much, and is that where we go to having more and more processed foods? Well, processed foods have been a benefit to our health in a lot of ways. Uh, when you process foods, you make it safer. You eliminate the pathogens. You um, make it short, more shelf-stable so we don't waste as much food. Uh, we're also able to add nutrients to the food and make it um, even healthier for us. Um, yes, there's some negative aspects to processed foods. Some, some processed foods have too much sugar, too much salt, uh, but those are not all processed foods, and you can make choices when you go to the store as to what you buy. Um, I think that going back to your question about who's cooking and who understands food, um, we have, as a society, moved away from uh, spending a lot of time in the kitchen preparing food. And for good or bad, I think that um, we do other things, uh, and we, we may no, no, not everybody wants to spend you know, half of the day preparing dinner. They want to be able to do other things. Uh, so processed foods has allowed that to happen. Um, do I, th I think people uh, should know how to cook, and I think that we are wanting people to make sure that they, they do know how to prepare food because it, it's a, a healthy thing to be able to do. As an educator, do you find part of your time talking to uh, people of all ages uh, that may not really know how to grow a garden, how to do that, and what the benefits are of the foods that they can gather from the garden? Well, I don't spend too much time teaching people about gardening. That's more of the horticulture uh, side of things. I'm more on the nutrition and food science side. And, but I do believe that um, there is a growing interest in, in gardening, and I think that a lot of people are wanting to be able to do that and, and produce food in their yard. I don't know that it totally... Um, pays for the costs. I think that uh, you can spend a lot of money growing a few tomatoes in your yard as opposed to buying them at a store where you get a you know more efficient cost. So I don't know that, that home gardening um, solves a lot of our problems. It does bring people back to where the food comes from and certainly a fresh uh, tomato from your garden is going to be have a little bit of a different taste. But whether or not it's a uh, it's a necessary component to a healthy diet. I, I don't believe that. Very good. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Absolutely. You're welcome. And stay with us. We'll return right after this. For more information about today's show or to suggest a topic, visit us on the web in ohiocountry.com. That's in ohiocountry.com. Hello once again, everybody. We're visiting now with Dr. Marty Matlock of the University of Arkansas. Marty, uh, good to have you with us. It's an honor to be here. 
You had the opportunity to uh, visit in a panel discussion uh, in Columbus, and uh, the topic of that discussion was sustainability. What do, I guess, what do you mean when you talk about sustainability? Sustainability is complex in some ways, simple in others. In fact, what I often say to folks is it, it's really not that complicated, it's just hard. It's like loving your neighbor. You know, the concept of loving your neighbor is pretty easy. Actually doing it can be pretty hard sometimes. I like the definition that the, that the Field to Market Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture has developed. This is a group of farmers, farm representatives, and supply chain folks. They said it's meeting the needs of today while enhancing future generations' ability to meet their needs. Now, how, I guess, would uh, various communities and uh, government regulations, how do they tend to, or do they, tend to hamper uh, the efforts of sustainability? Sustainability is, uh, is in, at an enterprise level, that is at a farm level, is really about everything you do on the, on the farm. To the extent that policies impede our ability to be sustainable, it really has to do with those unintended consequences where, you're, where you have to uh, implement a practice for food safety, for example, that also increases runoff or increases uh, emissions of, of greenhouse gases. Everything's in balance. There is no simple answer for anything. But I, the good news is that sustainability by and large, is not a governmental program. It's not being driven by uh, federal or state governments. In fact, the federal and state governments are trying to figure out what's going on in this movement. It's really being driven by the marketplace, and it's not even being driven by consumers. By and large, consumers care. They don't want to buy stuff that hurts people, but they don't particularly make product choices or pay that much more for sustainable or more sustainable products. But what consumers do want is they want to make sure that their products are safe and secure and that they can, they can have access to them. And so the people who make the products that consumers buy are desperately concerned about the safety, security, and stability of their supply chains. And that's where the movement is coming from. It's just good business. So basically what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, a large operation, a small operation, uh, an organic operation, uh, there's room for, for all. Right. Sustainability is not a, it's not a destination. You'll never be sustainable because the only way you know you're not sustainable is when you fail when you are not sustainable, when you look back and you no longer can sell your product or produce your product. So sustainability is a journey. It's a process. It's a process of continuous improvement, of continuous learning, adapting, testing, documenting, communicating, sharing that information so that we learn from each other to be better at what we do. But at the same time, then, as we look to the future with more and more people on this earth and the desire to produce more food for those people and, and to do all we can do to eliminate hunger on the planet, uh, we still have challenges. Absolutely. We, we have about 7.1 billion people on the planet today. And by the way, over 50% of them live in, in cities now. We're an urban species for the first time in our history. 7.1 billion people in the next 40 years will have perhaps as many as 3 billion more, as many as 10 billion people on the planet. That's 3 billion uh, people, more people coming to dinner, folks. That's a lot of mouths to feed. Now, the good news is right now we could meet the, the caloric needs and the nutritional needs of everyone on the planet if they had the money to buy the food. The problem is we have too many people making less than two bucks a day. They can't afford to buy the food. Poverty and hunger are two sides of the same evil, evil coin. If we want to reduce hunger, we have to enhance prosperity of humanity. I believe we can do that through land-based prosperity. We can, in, we can bring people globally, as well as in the United States, out of poverty by creating better opportunities to produce profitably from the land. At the same time, that's more than just what farmers can do, what we can do in agriculture, uh, energy, and a, a variety of other issues uh, need to be addressed as well. Every tool in our toolbox, every process we, we're, uh, that, that goes into our enterprise, our farming enterprise, our pro food processing enterprise, our educational activities, has to be considering our, our, our immediate and long-term consequences. This is just, again, good business. Um, if we're consuming a process or product that in manufacturing what we do, if, we're, if, if our agricultural production practices require, requires elemental phosphorus, for example, and we're running out of it, then the cost of that product is only going to increase. How long can you stay in business if you see phosphate costs going up and going up and going up? If, the co if, your, if your industry is tied to energy costs and energy costs are going up or, or unpredictable, how long can you stay in business? How well buffered are you? Those are all sustainability questions. They're also good business questions. Well, I bet you can see why uh, there must be a waiting line for your classes back at the University of Arkansas. Dr. Marty Matlock has been our guest. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. And stay with us back with more right after this. 
Hi, I'm Alan Davis at Alan Davis Insurance and Financial Services. Whether it be for your auto, home, life, farm, commercial, truck, crop, or financial service, give our office a call. 800-686-2148 or visit us on the web at allendavisinsurance.com. It's time now for the Koenig Care Minute, brought to you by Koenig Equipment. To maximize your equipment uptime, remember Koenig. Welcome back to In Ohio Country Today, and with me is Aaron Koenig with Koenig Equipment. You know, there are certain times of the year when it's, it's the right time to buy pieces of equipment, and uh, this time of the year is the right time to buy a used combine. Why is that? Well, it's the right time of year, and it, quite frankly, it's the right year, too. Uh, to buy a used combine, and there, there are several reasons. Um, I think the first of which is that it's really a buyer's market. So if you take a look around at the inventory that's available today, whether it's a late model combine or an older combine, there's lots of it to go around, plenty of selection. So that, that's good for the consumer, good for the farmer. The other thing is, is that despite the strong ag economy and, and we've seen sections of the used market uh, grow, the prices increase, most notably tractors, combines have been the exception. And in fact, we've seen pricing flat on used combines. And in some cases, like your larger class eight, class nine combines, we've actually seen prices go down. So again, that, that's good news for the farmer and a real opportunity there. Well, you know, uh, when you talk about uh, uh, not only the pricing, but the value. I mean, me as a producer uh, and, and a lot of the, my customers and folks that I work with, uh, as well as your customers, want to maximize their return. Well, we want to be reali realistic about this. A, a combine, particularly late model use combine, is a very big investment. So don't want to make light of that. But in terms of the cost of ownership, uh, the unit cost of ownership, more specifically, cost per bushel. If you look at the productivity um, and the capacity of the machines today and the increased harvest that we're seeing, I think you're actually seeing the unit cost of owning a machine come down. And so I think that's an opportunity too for the customer and it translates into value. Well, you know, not only are we talking about the capacity of the machine, but the technology and, and the used machines. Right, absolutely. You know, another point too, the durability is there. So your maintenance cost goes down with this newer technology. But you talk about technology, one advantage to buying a late model use combine is that along with it comes all that integrated technology. So your options are you can kind of close that technology gap and you can get it integrated into the machine already as opposed to say retrofitting an older machine where you've got the hassle and quite, a, quite frankly, additional expense of individual components. So I think in that case, if you want to close that technology gap, consider late model used. Well, you know, when we're talking about, we talk about technology and the, the, the efficient cost of ownership, but let's face it, as a businessman, an entrepreneur and a business person, mm -hmm. I have to make the right decisions when it comes to the cost of my money and what's in it for me from a tax standpoint. Right. Well, as we know, interest rates are at an all-time low or have been for quite some time, but there are signs general economy is getting better, you know, the Fed's starting to talk a little bit. So we're talking about interest rate increases, and we've seen that. So if you're going to borrow money to buy, good time to do that right now, I think. The other thing that's in play is um, with the Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012, they actually took the um, Section 179 and brought the one-time deduction back up to $500,000. And that's for tax year 2013. So great opportunity this year to expense that purchase. And uh, doesn't look like without um, some intervention from Congress that we'll have that same benefit in 2014. Well, Aaron, you know, uh, uh, when we talk about, um, you know, all these points, it's really not a better time to buy a used combine. I think so, it's particularly from the consumer's point of view. I mean, as I mentioned, it's a buyer's market, uh, low cost per bushel ownership right now. You can close that technology gap. You can borrow money inexpensively, and you get the tax benefit. Somebody wanted to find out a little more information about that. Where can they go? Well, they're welcome to visit any of our Ohio locations and talk about the John Deere uh, brand that we've got carried there. And they can also visit KoenigEquipment.com, visit our used equipment page. Aaron, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. We'll be back with more in Ohio Country Today right after this.
Hello once again, everybody. Visiting right now with Joe Logan of the Ohio Environmental Council. Joe, you had an opportunity to visit about agriculture, which you know quite a bit because you are a, a farmer here in the Buckeye State. Before we get into those questions about what happened here today, uh, tell us a little bit about the operation back home and your involvement in agriculture here in the Buckeye State. Yeah, well, I'm from a, a fifth-generation uh, dairy farm up in northeastern Ohio. I was a, a dairy farmer for most of my adult uh, productive life, and uh, just the last 10 or 15 years, I started getting into the agricultural policy uh, and sustainability and environmental impacts of agriculture, and that's kind of where I live these days. But the farm is still operational in northeastern Ohio. We grow corn, soybeans, oats, wheat, hay. Uh, we graze some cattle, uh, do maple sugar, and we still have uh, a little toehold in the vineyard up there. We do some grapes and wine. Okay, so a lot of variety here, and well, actually, when we talk about sustainability, and that was the topic of the panel that you were on today, uh, variety plays a part, I guess. Variety helps uh, achieve that sustainability that all farms and, and well, businesses, for that matter, would, uh, would like to achieve. Yeah, the very uh, name sustainability indicates sustainability over time. And so we have to be thinking not only only over uh, seasons, we have to start thinking about decades and centuries and millennia. And, uh, you know, agriculture has been operating for some 10,000 years, 13,000 years uh, on this globe uh, in kind of what, the way we understand it now. And uh, there have been some trends that are really working in the wrong direction in agriculture in terms of our loss of topsoil, in terms of our consumptive use of fossil fuels that are adding to climate change and a number of issues like that that are really worrisome. So we as a culture, we as a society, we as a planetary uh, citizens need to be addressing those issues of sustainability. We need to be uh, refining and redeveloping our systems so that they can work over not only uh, decades, but generations and, and centuries and millennia. Joe, how do we prioritize those problems that we, we can see today that we know are problems and need to be fixed, and, and those problems that may not even show up to us at, at the moment uh, that we need to sort of uh, game plan for in the future? How, how do we get that balance? Yeah, well, there, there's no question that there's a moving target, and, and a lot of times it's the issue of the day that gets our attention. Uh, right now in Ohio, we are experiencing some some very difficult times, uh, issues with water quality and with the harmful algae blooms. Uh, and we are discovering now through a great deal of research that the primary source uh, that remains for those algae blooms, the, the phosphorus that feeds those algae blooms, a lot of it is coming from our farms. And so we need to find better ways to uh, capture and utilize the, the phosphorus that we purchase and the, or the phosphorus that we may get from a nearby livestock facility. We need to make sure that it goes into our soils, that it nourishes our soils and our crops and the biomass that's in the soils and stays there and it does not leach away into streams and rivers and, uh, and pollute beaches and, uh, and cause other people problems. Well, when you talk about uh, uh addressing the problem of, of leaching, if you will, a comment was made, uh, something as simple as grass. Just let's plant more grass and, and help uh, soak up the problem before it gets to some place where it's a, a major problem. Easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, there, there is no question that uh, having a grass cover uh, on your farm fields is an ideal way to limit the amount of uh, nutrient loss you're going to have. Uh, not only does the, those roots of the grass go down and capture those nutrients and incorporate them into the biomass, but they stabilize the soil and really transform that whole soil matrix into a system that effectively filters uh, the medium as it goes through it. So grass and any other cover crops are an excellent uh, resource and something we wholeheartedly support. But when, we, when we talk about agriculture, a lot of times we don't uh, stop to think about uh, in the ag community, there's a lot of construction. There's a lot of uh, concrete that's the, replacing our, our uh, uh, land that we farm. Uh, and with construction, also more erosion. Uh, how do we address that kind of the problem when a farmer doesn't have uh, direct access to potentially making a stop? Yeah, well, uh, erosion is a horrible issue in agriculture, and it has been that way for uh, a couple hundred years especially. 
uh, since farmers started very aggressive uh, tillage operations. And of course, in, in modern day, uh, sort of no-till operations have evolved. We are developing technology now that can very effectively work through a, uh, a, cover, uh, a cover crop or a duff cover on, uh, on fields and very effectively plant a, a good solid population of the crops that we need. And we are able to manage those and nourish those in a very effective way. We are finding uh, at least equal productivity. We are finding a dramatic reduction in the amount of energy that farmers use on those systems. And we're finding generally a very sustainable system that accrues carbon in soils rather than uh, diminishes it. Well, Joe, let me ask you a, a more of a personal question. You have the opportunity now with the Ohio Environmental Council to uh, help agriculture, but also to, to bridge the uh, educational gap, so to speak, with the non-ag uh, crowd as well. That has to be personally satisfying. Well, it is indeed. You know, uh, agriculture uh, has always had an enormous environmental footprint. And I guess uh, I, I see my uh, position uh, as an opportunity to do a couple of things. First of all, we can make sure that farmers are keenly aware of new research that's going on about uh, responsible use of nutrients, responsible uses of pesticides and other things that we know have potential to impact the environment, and also to bring knowledge about the practical nature of agriculture and the things that challenges that farmers meet every day, bring that information into uh, public decision makers, uh, the folks down at the state house, uh, the folks in the state agencies. Uh, most of them, as you know, are generations removed from the farm, and to the extent we can make those uh, experiences real, the better off we'll be. Well, Joe, always a pleasure. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. And stay with us. Back with more right after this. Hi, I'm Alan Davis at Alan Davis Insurance and Financial Services. Whether it be for your auto, home, life, farm, commercial, truck, crop, or financial service, give our office a call. 800-686-2148. Or visit us on the web at allendavisinsurance.com. I'm Terry McClure, a fifth generation soybean farmer. Farming can be tough, but we have the Ohio Soybean Council investing farmers' dollars to find new uses for soybeans. Their research helps develop better beans for livestock, poultry, and for people. It also helps create new products like soy-based cleaning supplies and ink cartridges. Plus, cleaner burning soy biodiesel reduces our dependence on foreign oil. Soybeans are Ohio's number one agricultural export. To learn more, visit SoyOhio.org. Hey, that's going to do it for this week's edition of In Ohio Country Today from COSI in beautiful downtown Columbus. I want to thank our friends at the Franklin County Farm Bureau for this beautiful display here at COSI. And uh, also want to thank our friends at the uh, uh, Ohio Farm Bureau Federation as well as our friends at the Ohio Soybean Council for today's food dialogues. Very interesting uh, panel discussions, Dan, and uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. If our viewers would like to get more information, they can go to those respective web websites to get uh, all of that info. And if you want more information, as always, you can always go to our website at inohiocountry.com. Have a good day, everybody.